please give a listen. This is going to really, really be educational. Charlie Butte is a gem in American society to have someone, one of 12, am I right? One of 12 people in the world that has walked on the moon. And we have one of those here today. He walked on the moon in 1972. His name is Charlie Duke, an American astronaut. Welcome, Charlie. Thanks a lot. Well, this is uh, uh, my wife and I on our first time at your Lonesome Dove Fest. And thanks, uh, Alton Luciemba, uh, for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be here. And uh, the, sorry the rain has uh, put a damper on stuff to us. But uh, anyway, we're here. One of, the th one of the great advantages of being on the moon, you don't have any rain up there, no clouds or anything, since there's no atmosphere. Uh, we had a great time on Apollo uh, 16. I was the 10th uh, man to walk on the moon uh, <clears throat> during the Apollo program. Of, there were 12 of us total. Uh, years ago, in 1965, I graduated from test pilot school in California. Uh, and I was working for uh, Chuck Yeager, who was a commandant of the test pilot school. And a month after I started to work for him, I read an article in the Los Angeles Times that said, NASA's looking for more astronauts. Please apply. So I applied with 3,500 other guys and uh, was fortunate to get selected. Uh, took about eight months uh, for us to uh, they go through the process. And in April of 1966, uh, my wife Dottie and our little son Charles uh, left California, moved to Houston, and we started our training in the uh, uh, astronaut program and for the Apollo program. Uh, I was so excited to have been selected. I had uh, dreamed about it for about a year uh, before I got selected. Uh, when I was a little kid growing up in South Carolina, there wasn't any space program, so I never uh, thought I'd uh, you know, go into space. And I told my mama I'm going to walk on the moon one day. Mama would have sent me to the psychiatric hospital because there was uh, just no astronauts. But I wanted to serve my country, and so I went to the Naval Academy. I became an Air Force officer out of the Naval Academy. And from there, went to, became a fighter pilot, test pilot. And the best job you could have is a astronaut was as a test pilot according to Chuck Yeager was to be an astronaut so I volunteered and uh, as I said got selected so we moved to Houston in 1966 and uh, we started our training uh, mostly at first it was just learning about NASA learning the systems of the spacecraft we had two in Apollo the command module which you rode to the moon in and you came home in which you launched in and then the lunar module, which is the one you landed on the moon. So we had all of these training systems and stuff like that. Plus we had geology. The, uh, the whole purpose of going to the moon was to pick up rocks. And uh, we were fighter pilots, you know, and uh, that's a rock and that's a piece of dirt. That was about my knowledge of geology. And so uh, we did a lot of geology with uh, Bill Marburger, who was at the University of Texas and uh, was one of our chief instructors and others around the country. And we did some great trips to the Big Bend, to uh, the uh, uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, the Mexico, around Ajo, Arizona, out to California, Oregon, all over uh, Colorado doing uh, geology. But the most fun trips were to uh, Hawaii. Uh, and so we had uh, looked at the rocks of Hawaii, which a lot of volcanics out there. So the moon was supposed to be volcanic, which it turned out the dark areas of the moon are. When you look at the moon, the, the dark areas are the valleys or the mori. The old ancients thought they were oceans uh, of water, but it turned out they were volcano, volcanic. Well, we landed in a place called Descartes, which is the mountains of the moon. Uh, and Neil Armstrong had landed 300 miles from where we landed. Now, if Neil Armstrong had come to Earth as an alien and landed in Corpus Christi, we would have landed in the top of the Himalaya Mountains. So it was that much elevation difference. So we were way up in the top of the mountain. So finally I got selected uh, to uh, work in, uh, on Apollo 10 as support. Then I worked with uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin as Apollo 11, which as you know was the first landing on the moon. 
Well, I was in mission control talking to them when they landed on the moon. And uh, to be honest, it got so tense in mission control, we were holding our breath because we were running out of gas. Uh, we had a, 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 a fuel limit, and when we got to a certain limit, I called up one minute. Uh, Houston, uh, uh, I said, Eagle, 60 seconds. That meant he had 60 seconds to land. Uh, and then I called Eagle, 30 seconds, and he still wasn't on the ground. So you can imagine how tense it was. We were that close, and we were about to call an abort. Well, about 13 seconds later, I heard uh, from Buzz Aldrin, contact, engine stop. Well, it was a, you knew they were on the ground because when you stop the engine, you go land. Hopefully, they were right side up. Uh, and uh, so there was a pregnant pause, and then uh, Neil said, uh, Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And uh, I was so excited, I couldn't pronounce Tranquility. It came out Twainquility. And I said, Roger, uh, 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 tranquility base, uh, you know, we copy you on the ground, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue, we're breathing again. So uh, there was a big cheer went up in mission control. So the very first time we tried to land, we did it. Wasn't much gas left, but we did it. Uh, we didn't know where we had done it. Somewhere on the moon they landed, so we, not where we thought they were. Uh, but anyway, it was a successful landing. Then I was back up through on Apollo 13, uh, and uh, was involved in the, uh, the, the famous measles. Uh, I caught the measles uh, before the flight and exposed everybody to the measles. So they had to change part of their crew. Well, the guy I trained with, Jack Swagger, took, uh, went on to that crew and then the guy that I exposed to the measles, Mattingly, came back on our crew. Well, anyway, we spent 35 hours in mission control uh, after the accident uh, and uh, getting, trying to get them back safely. And I'll tell you, if NASA was a lesson in teamwork, uh, it took everybody working precisely and accurately and, and uh, diligently to get the mission completed. Uh, everybody did their job. And the astronauts were sort of the top of the pyramid, if you will, there was uh, but 400,000 people underneath working to get you to the moon and back safely. So when they had the accident on the way to the moon and lost all their oxygen, you can't imagine how we scrambled to make get it safe so that they would get back safely. Uh, and sure enough, uh, with a lot of hard work, and fortunately two rolls of duct tape, uh, we built a contraption uh, that would allow the carbon dioxide to come out of the air uh, and we got them back safely. Uh, and uh, I was very pessimistic at first. I didn't think we had enough oxygen. How are you going to, the lunar module was their lifeboat. And it was designed on their mission for two guys for three days. Now we got three guys for four days. How do you make it last? And that was our challenge to make it last that we got back. And sure enough, we figured out a way to do that. Well, two years later now, I'm on Apollo 16, and we've all trained, and we're ready to go. And so it was on a Sunday afternoon in April was our launch, uh, was scheduled for our launch. Uh, all my family was there, uh, Dottie with our boys, our parents, uh, my twin brother, his family, everybody was there. And so uh, we climbed into the spacecraft, uh, and that was really impressive. Every time else I'd been out to the launch pad to see the vehicle, there were just people everywhere just wandering around. But that morning, you just walked out, got out of the van, and you looked up, and here's this vehicle 360 feet above you to the very top, and there was nobody out there. And the vehicle looked alive because it was just off the, boiling off the fuel and stuff. So we took the elevator up, and I uh, went out onto the, what was called the white room, and we started getting in the spacecraft. John Young got in first, and he was on the left. I got in second, and I was on the right, and Mattingly slid into the center seat. We strapped in real tight in case there was an abort, and you got tumbled around, 
Uh, and so we were real tight inside, shoulder to shoulder. The spacecraft was about 12 feet across, about the width of a little bit wider than one of these tables here. Uh, and, uh, and the instrument panel was about a foot and a half above you. And the windows were covered over uh, with a special cover so you couldn't see outside. Well, about an hour before liftoff, they closed the hatch and the guys waved at us and they left. They didn't want to be around when it lit off. Now, if you haven't seen a Saturn, go to Houston at the Johnson Space Center and there's a real one over there uh, that they refinished, uh, refurbished. Well, this vehicle was 363 feet tall. It was 33 feet in diameter and weighed six and a half million pounds when it sat on the launch pad. There were five engines at the bottom of this thing and they were pushing with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. So you had seven and a half million pushing six and a half million. So it didn't go off very fast. It just slowly started going. But it was a very limber, it didn't look limber, but it was a very limber vehicle. And so the engines are moving down at the bottom and you're up at the top and it was, it was as the engine moved, the vehicle started to shake. And it, and it got up to you and it was really shaking when you got up to the, to the uh, spacecraft. And I didn't remember anybody telling me it was supposed to shake so hard. So I got a little nervous, couldn't see outside. I didn't have any flight instruments. And I got uh, a, a more anxious than nervous, I guess. And later on, uh, you know, I could really feel my heart pumping in my spacesuit. And uh, so later on, when I got back, I asked the flight surgeon, I said, uh, what was my heartbeat at liftoff? He said, man, you were excited. It was 144 uh, when we lifted off. And I said, well, what was John's? And he was a commander, it was his second mission. Oh, John's was 70. So uh, he was uh, cool to stone and I was just really excited. But I mean, it really vibrated. The best way I can describe it, if you can imagine a big giant with a 360 foot long fishing pole and he's shaking it down here and you're out over the other end of that big cane pole going like crazy from side to side. Well, that lasted for two minutes and 40 seconds. And at the end of the two minutes and 40 seconds,